Broadcasting from the Tazan Lake Lodge Studio. This is Sporting Journal Radio. Presented by OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. Now here's your host, Brett Amundsen. Welcome to the show. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thanks for tuning in on this station right here by downloading the podcast wherever you get your favorite podcasts or maybe you're watching this on YouTube, Facebook, Rumble. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you like what you see, please share this with your friends. Smash that like button. Follow us. Like it. Comment below if you have a question or if you have a story you, you think we should cover on this show right here. Uh, let us know about it and uh, comment below or check us out. Send us an, e- an email at sportingjournalradio.com. Uh, Dan Amundsen is with us right over there. Wait a minute. Hey, you're, hey. Not right over, you're not right over there today. Where are you, Dan? I'm in northwest Wisconsin chasing some whitetails around. Our family tradition for years was going up to northwest Wisconsin where we uh, had with like four family cabins between all of us mm-hmm. family members at one point. And uh, the nine-day Thanksgiving week traditional gun deer season was, uh, was a big part of our hunting uh, heritage growing up that's changed a little bit. Some family members have come and gone. I'm not over there this year, uh, but you made it over there. And it seems like every year opening day is always the best time. How was it this year in Wisconsin on opening day? You know, it's been better than it has been the last few years. We uh, we harvested a few deer. Wasn't a whole lot of shooting going on in the woods, um, but it wasn't bad for us. And, and that maybe it seemed like a lack of people, almost lack of traffic coming up Friday for a little bit, at least on my drive. Um, and that maybe there were some less people and maybe that helped us out. Actually, normally we like that push of deer, but we've had good deer movement through these woods throughout the fall, it sounds like. And so maybe having a little more natural movement uh, served us well. And we were able to take a few deer, myself included. So we've got some venison for the fall or for the winter uh, throughout the year. So we're pretty excited. But yet as, you know, like a typical Wisconsin year, it uh, it slowed down. Um, and hopefully things pick back up for the group this weekend. Uh, I can't be there, but uh, hope the group will continue to hunt through the weekend. So hopefully they can fill a few more tags before we're done. Well, you saw something kind of interesting with that deer you shot. I'm going to ask you about that here in just a second. Uh, we're also going to talk waterfowl this week. We got Corey Loeffler from the DRC Call Company. He was down in Oklahoma uh, spending some time with the uh, the guys down at Falco, which is always a great time. I got to meet them last year. Great group of guys, plus a whole bunch of industry people were there, too. We'll find out who all was there, why they were there, how the hunting was, and uh, what Corey's got up his sleeve right now in his call shop or outside of his call shop, perhaps. Uh, we'll talk to Corey in a little bit. Also, Joe Henry's going to join us to talk about early ice up at Lake of the Woods. How are they checking the ice? Where's the ice at? What are some early ice activities uh, that you can take part in up there at Lake of the Woods? We'll find out. And Eric Osberg from Ottertail Lakes Country, Country will join us to talk about early ice up in uh, Ottertail County and, and what his Thanksgiving plans are and how he feels about Thanksgiving. That's all coming up in a little bit. Dan, who is this week's show brought to us by? Yeah, this week's show is brought to us by Haybell Heights Campground and Resort on Devil's Lake. Plan a trip to Devil's Lake at haybellheights.com. Ottertail Lakes Country. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. Lake of the Woods Tourism. Plan a trip to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Tazan Lake Lodge. Plan a trip of a lifetime. Catch giant little trout and pike at tazanlake.com. Onyx Hunt, know where you stand with Onyx. Mid-Migration Outfitters, hunt geese out at the famous Lockpaw Refuge in our heated pits. Learn more at midmigrationoutfitters.com. And Prairie Sportsman, watch episodes anytime at prairiesportsman.org. Thank you, Dan. So it's, I'm not going to say it's really a controversy, but everybody's got different opinions on deer hunting and what should be shot, what shouldn't be shot, what should be managed, what shouldn't be managed. And um, I'm not going to discount anybody's opinions because uh, somebody may be right. We all have different goals potentially for what we want to see as the, as an outcome for the whitetail season. And then we all have different ideas on how to grow bigger bucks or to grow the, the deer herd, things like that. Now I've I come from a camp where I love to eat venison, so I'm kind of a meat hunter, but I also want to grow big bucks. So that's a bit of a dilemma for a lot of people. For those that want to grow big bucks, they don't like to shoot big does necessarily because that big doe is probably pregnant, maybe with twins or triplets. So now you're taking a couple of deer, some potential bucks that could grow into giants, depending on their, their genetics. You're taking all those deer out of the population. So what do you do then at that point? Do you shoot a small buck? Well, then you're taking away the chance for that buck 
to grow into a bigger deer. Well, that leaves you with, with fawns. Now fawns can be delicious, but you might not get a lot of meat off of it. So who's right, who's wrong? It's a, it's a discussion that nobody will ever win because everybody has their own opinion on it and you could talk hours and hours and hours about it. Uh, but basically I like to target a big buck and if I don't shoot one, I like to shoot a big doe because I wanna eat the meat and I don't want to take a potential bigger buck out of the picture. Dan, you shot a nice doe over there in Wisconsin or what you thought was a nice doe this year. Yeah, I did. And it turned out to be a little buck. <laughs> it, it was two deer came in at the same time, a uh, buck chasing what I again thought was a doe. And now granted, I was sitting with my dad. We always like to sit together on opening day just for tradition's sake and for good time's sake. Um, and so we took the first shot at the buck and it looked like it was a good clean hit. And but we we're going to try to hit it again just to, to put it down and make sure we didn't let that deer get away and so I settled my scope in the opening where I thought the deer was going to come out deer popped out and I shot it and it dropped but as I saw it drop there were no antlers and I ended up being what I again thought was the doe but I thought oh sweet got a nice doe for the freezer now let's deal with the buck and the buck ended up being a clean miss and did get away which was unfortunate um it was a nicer deer but uh, that's the way it goes uh but I went up to go field dress the deer uh there was on the other side of his legs uh was not a doe anymore and it had, it had little nubs that looked like they, you know, either the antlers had already fallen off or the nubs had been rubbed. So they looked all bloody and whatnot, you know, not like a traditional buck. buck. It was a bigger deer. Um, and so why those two deer were running around at the same time, they, you know, did they get just get pushed together on opening day? What happened? I don't really know. Um, I was a little disappointed that it was a little buck just for that same thing of trying to let little bucks go. But to be fair, I, even if it, I knew fair. it was a little buck, yeah, I wasn't going to let it pass. You know, I've yeah. been chasing antlers with the bull all year, and this is the gun season. We've got a plethora of tags. There's a fair amount of deer here. We don't really have decent land to manage. So we're just going to try to fill the freezer. And I was going to do that right away. The last couple of years, I hadn't filled my tags over here. And I've had a lot of deer tags lately go unfilled. And quite frankly, I was tired of it. So we were, we were going to shoot a deer. Uh, so I was happy to harvest it and happy to have venison. It's been great. Um, but yeah, it was strange. I, I would have bet a lot of money that that was a doe. Hmm. Well, lots of jokes we can make right now. <laughs> Probably get us in trouble on YouTube. We won't make those jokes. Uh, but, uh, venison for the freezers, always a good thing. And, um, you know, again, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know what else to say about that one, but I still need to shoot a deer too. And I'm going to start targeting does here uh, as the season gets a little bit later and later. And uh, I would like to do it before it gets too cold, even though it's starting to get too cold already. I seem like, Dan, I feel like I always find myself in this position trying to shoot a deer in December and freezing my backside off out there while I'm doing it. But I definitely spend a lot of time pheasant hunting, which is part of my problem. And I had tiny out and as it's getting a little bit colder, the pheasants are stu starting to move into some thicker cover. And normally that means cattails. Well, I was hunting this piece the other day and it was this, I'm not even sure what it was, but it was this weird, gnarly, bent over, thick, hard, rigid a plant of some sort and tiny was kind of running around in it and i wanted to get a video because the way she was going through it was cracking me up so i was trying to get a video of it so i whip out my phone and i'm like all right tiny go back in there and she didn't want to go back in because it's like i was just in there so i it this is me uh convincing her to go back in and, and so you can see we're actually on a mode path in the in the middle of all this but i'm trying to send her back into the thick stuff and she's like ah, i was just in there though back. So I'm like, all right, but wait, wait for it is all I can say. Come on, get in there. Check the birds. Watch this. <laughs> I'm checking, Dad. I'm checking. Back. All right, I'm going in. <laughs> Just launches herself on, <laughs> on top of that and through it, and uh, and then comes to comes back to me. She actually can sneak underneath most of it and through it. So uh, it was kind of fun to watch her and that stuff there. And then uh, I. And then I took, I hunted another spot and I don't know if it's because of the drought this year or what, but there's not been a lot of good grass to walk this year, Dan. So I haven't seen big, 
tall, healthy blue stem in a lot of places. So I don't know if it's the drought. I don't know if COVID has kept a lot of DNR personnel from being out on wildlife management areas to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, manage some of that grass, whether it's prescribed burns, whether it's replanting, whether it's, uh, you know, some sort of grass management. I know (laughs) COVID has kept people from working outside, which is great. Um, so I don't know what the deal is, but there hasn't been a lot of good grass out there until I walked this piece the other day. Uh, and this was some of the best blue stem that I've seen. I, I've walked two yeah. spots this year. One of them is a brand new WMA that was private. So it was probably privately managed or maybe, maybe pheasants forever came in and did some work on it last year. I'm not sure. This piece is a walk-in access piece and I, I haven't hunted it for a couple of years. It gets a lot of pressure. So I went and checked it out on Monday just because I hadn't hunted it for a couple of years. I wanted to see what it was like. I didn't see a lot of birds. I shot one rooster out there, uh, but it was a huge piece of some of the best, healthiest looking blue stem I have seen all year. And Dan, it's been interesting. Uh, some of the Facebook groups, people have been complaining about walking access areas. This year. The, the complaints always come this time of year between um, some of the public land where there's been some emergency haying or grazing being done. And people are upset because they're, they're public land hunters and all of a sudden there's one of their properties that they hunt has been taken away from them. So I understand their gripe, but, you know, particularly with the walk-in access program, that's still private ground. And uh, if they have to do some emergency hang on it, I mean, that comes first. Um, Sometimes they're not supposed to do it. It doesn't get enforced. There's some gray areas, whatever. It's a tough deal all around. But this walk-in access piece had some of the best uh, grass I'd seen on it all year. And Dan, I, I've been getting so tired of walking through hummocks and cattails and slew. I literally was pheasant hunting in waders the other day. Uh, oh, so when I, when I walked this piece with the, it was like walking on a sidewalk, uh, with blue stem all around me. I brought Mika. She loved it. Uh, we weren't even tired afterwards and we walked, uh, we walked the whole piece. We did a lot of walking, a lot of steps and, uh, it was nice. So there is some good ground out there. You might have to go and search for it. Um, but that's, uh, that's what hunting is all about. Finding new places to go is half the adventure. All right, Dan, um, we got to talk, uh, fishing. When we come back, we're going to attack, check in with, uh, Joe Henry and we got Eric Osberg and Corey Loeffler coming up. Stay there. Ice fishing season is here. This winter, plan a trip to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Not only will you have the chance to catch their legendary perch, but this year, Hay Bale Heights has been catching big walleye after big walleye. And they're doing it from a mobile, comfortable snow bear. No matter how cold it is outside, you're warm and toasty on the inside. Learn more and book a trip today at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. I fish and always will. We're talking about early ice fishing right now and uh, some tips on how you can check the ice. Joe Henry is going to join us from Lake of the Woods Tourism right now. Joe, how's it going? Hey, Brad, doing good. And I fish and I always will also. Heck yeah. Well, uh, how, uh, how um, I, you know, we had some really cold weather late this past week. We had some cool weather prior to that. We're obviously building ice. Uh, there are some places up there where guys are going out on the ice a little bit. You know, just starting, and I, I just, I'm real careful about what I say in that regard because there's always some uh, people that are pretty aggressive getting onto that early ice, and, you know, we don't want anybody to get hurt, you know, but right. th- things are just starting. And, you, you know, Brett, uh, the, the way I, I'll speak to some of the, the ice guides up at Lake of the Woods, you know, the way a lot of them will test that ice is they have chain size, and then on the bar, they have different markers to say how many inches thick it is, and they can just go along and stick that chainsaw in there. And when it spits water, they can see, you know, where the ice is and that inch marker. And it's a very fast way of, of doing things. And, you know, uh, so they're, they're starting to mark trails on the back bays. Um, you know, if, if things continue, I, I think there'll be some spearing perhaps going on this weekend. Um, we have a few resorts that, that uh, cater to, to spears. So they'll put out dark houses and, uh, 
certainly some people do it on their own and and that'll start in the back bays and then while that's going on as ice starts to form in in the larger bays towards uh, towards the lake more and then eventually the lake you know we have ice guides that are working together with personal you know flotation devices on in some cases are using airboats they're going to get out and they're going to start marking trails and you, you know i'm always a big adamant brett not not because i want people to pay the the 15 bucks to go go on somebody's ice trail I, i'm a big proponent of that because i've seen what can happen when people go off on their own and they have no idea how and why that trail was staked where it is and why you shouldn't go uh, just off of the trail. There might have been open water there. There might be springs. There might have been a, a somebody that went through on a side-by-side early on. I mean, who knows what happened? But the point of it is, if you stay on those marked trails and communicate with the people that are letting you out on those trails, you're going to be in pretty good shape. Yeah, I'm obviously uh, still hunting. I haven't even taken my ice fishing gear out. I know everyone wants to be first and everyone wants to do these YouTube videos of being out on early ice or Instagram posts or whatever. And yes, fishing can be good at times on early ice, but you know what? Fishing can be good, particularly on Lake of the Woods. Fishing can be good all winter long. And I, on a lake like that in particular, I don't think there's any need to rush out there, go venturing off into no man's land. Like the lake isn't even frozen over yet, right? I mean, it's it's uh, just pockets of ice here and there, and and obviously it's going to build as things get colder. But to me, it's not worth it. Like I don't like early ice personally. Mm-hmm. Call me whatever you want to call me about that, but I prefer the ice to build up a little bit. And I got other things going on. Like I'm uh, I'm hunting obviously, but uh, I like my ice to be safe. I personally don't want to go through it. So um, even even when it gets a little thicker, I got a floating suit. I got the ice picks. I'm trying to do what I can. But that being said, fishing can be pretty good early. Well, it, it can be, and it, and it is. And we know the fish are there because people have been catching them fall fishing. They're in their normal late fall haunts right off of Pine Island, off the South Shore, in different spots, and we know they're going to be waiting there. And normally that early ice bite is extremely good. So I will say this, that if we keep a, a real cold weather trend and we get some uh, good ice here early, you know, before Christmas, um, if you can make that extra trip up to one of the resorts, it's, it's going to – it's going to behoove you to do so because typically that's some extremely good fishing. And then what happens is as time goes on, I think it's a combination of bait that starts moving deeper. But also I think the, 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 the noise and the traffic and the pressure for more and more people in the ice push those walleyes. And, you know, we, our resorts will follow them all year long. And it's funny because they follow them out and they get a little bit more scattered then. And then what happens is somewhere midwinter, you might be fishing in 31 or 32 feet of water way out there. And all of a sudden you hear, ah, old Tommy boy, he's getting him in 24. So sometimes those walleyes double back. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's cr- really quite interesting to watch the whole thing. The bottom line is the, the resorts want to keep you safe, number one. And they're going to work their tails off to put their houses on fish for you, number two. Uh, or they're going to try to set you up if you have your own house uh, on their ice roads to, uh, to be successful. Well, and obviously walleyes are what Lake of the Woods is known for, but this time of year, uh, you know, in some of the smaller bays and different areas where the ice builds a little bit earlier and then obviously late season, uh, pike can be a, a pretty fun fish to target up there. Well, and it's funny because, you know, spearing isn't huge, huge on Lake of the Woods. Uh, and partly because we have that slot limit, Brett, 30 to 40 inches, you have to release them. So it makes it hard because you cannot spear a 30 to 40 inch pike. So, of course, when they're in the water, the big question is, how do you know? And, you know, the, the, the resorts do a pretty uh, pretty darn good job of educating clients that, you know, some different tricks and tips on how to how to estimate length. And, uh, you know, d- d- does a pike in that slot ever get stabbed, you know, with a spear? I'm sure it happens. I'm sure I know it happens once in a while. But most anglers are either going for those small fish to, to bring home under 30 inches. You can keep the, the limit on Lake of the Woods. You can keep three pike per day. And 30 to 40 inches, you must release. You can have one over 40 per day. But I tell you what, they do stick some really, really big pike. There you can see video of a, a big pike underneath the decoy. But uh, they do stick some real big ones. And that's staying water. But, you know, that water in those back bays is just clear enough. So they get out in that, I'm guessing, four to five feet of water. And those pike are there. And uh, you get some pike that are absolutely gigantuous back in there. <laughs> and, uh 
it, it's quite interesting. We have a few resorts, Brett, that, that set up the dark houses. Uh, the ones I can speak of off the top of my head are, you know, Bugsy's on Bostic and uh, uh, Johnson's Walleye Retreat, which are located in uh, Bostic Bay. And then, of course, Zippel Bay Resort located in Zippel Bay. Those are the three I know of. If there's more doing, I'm not aware of them right now. But nonetheless, it's, it's, if you like spearing, boy, it's a, it's a neat early ice activity. So uh, that spearing, I, and maybe it's because I'm getting older and I'm a proponent of catch and release. I know some guys just love to go out there and try to spear the biggest pike they can. And yeah, it's kind of neat to, to, to get one of those giant ones underneath you to spear it. But I target the small ones if I would spear because I want to target eaters because I like eating pike. Um, I don't want real small ones, but that upper, you know, that 26, 29, that's a great eating size for Northern Pike. And, um, and man, if you can, if you can target some of those smaller ones, you can get some great ones to eat. And then you don't have to worry about, you know, the slot as much. And you don't have to worry about trying to get one over 40. Like, I, I don't know. I'm on the fence about spearing ones that are over 40. I'm not going to fault anybody for doing it when it's legal, but, um, you know, if I catch a fish over 40, I put it back. I get a good picture. And if I want to do a mount, I get a replica. So it's, uh, that's, that's a tough one for spearing. Cause I, man, if I saw like a, like a low forties come through that big giant head, it'd be, it'd be real tempting, but I think I'd just try to get a video. I think. Yeah. You, you know, and I, I also think that's probably why, uh, spearing isn't the most popular activity in the world up at Lake of the Woods is because of that reason. There are some people that agree with you. You know, spearing is a little bit more work as far as getting that ice chunk out of there. And it's just a little bit different. You know, it's, it's, it's a small group of people when you think about it that spear in Minnesota and, and across the ice belt compared to the ice anglers. Right. So uh, if that, is that something we can find on your website? Like who would offer spearing? Can you search for spearing guide services? You know, we'd actually, yeah, we don't, we don't label, we don't, we don't actually bring those out. It's interesting that we haven't. Um, I mentioned the, the three to you, but, uh, you know, maybe what I'll do is I, uh, I probably will add those to our website. It's probably there you a good go. idea. Just, okay, there's a you consulting know, just, fee coming, coming at you. Well, it, it, it's not that it hasn't been considered, <laughs> but for all the reasons you talk about, oh, and also sure. for, for the people that say, well, how in the heck are you supposed to figure out a 30 to 40 inch, 40 inch pike that you can't spear. So, you know, you're telling me that if you spear a pike that's 30 to 40, you have to release it, even though it's probably gonna die. But that's, yes. you know, that's what makes spearing tough up at Lake of the Woods. And that's also why it's not the most popular activity. Now, to your point, it can still be enjoyable based on what you're after. If you're after that monster pike, it is legal. If you are after some pike, they're gonna fill the fry pan, that's also legal. And uh, it's also a fun activity. So again, I, I don't I don't wanna judge, I'm just kind of sharing information, but you can see why it gets a little bit dicey with that pike topic, or, or the well, spearing topic, I should say. I don't know what the legality of, of it would be in Minnesota or up at Lake of the Woods, but um, you know, when I've gone over to Wisconsin for that sturgeon spearing over there, a lot of times those guys will drop down uh, like uh, two PVC pipes that are that are together in a cross shape like that and they're uh, sometimes they're notched or marked so that when a fish swims in because they've got a slot on those fish and then you can kind of get a gauge of you know maybe see looking at that pike over one of those cross sections of pvc and you can try to kind of eyeball and then they got it on a rope so they can drop it down on the rope and then they can pull it up when they're done so they're not leaving anything in the lake so i don't know if that is something that's done up there or done anywhere else but that's something i've seen in the past to so try to help you judge that size of that fish well, I know I know some people uh, some people do it based on the size of their spear hole and they can kind of tell that way. Mm. I know some people do it based on how big the underbite is on a pike. So you can see that underbite and based on the underbite that kind of it's a telltale sign of the size of that pike. Um, yeah, there's some different ways, there's different tips and tricks they use, but you know even with all those tips and tricks it's not a perfect science. Well, I've been getting a couple of snaps from my friends up there. They've been busy working on bombers. One one kid, Cody, sent me a message today. Said they're all done working on bombers, getting them ready for the ice season. So it's uh, it's all starting to come together up there, Joe. The white ice rigs are going to go first. You know, heated ice trailers pulling people out. The bombers are ready. Um, I'm, I'm communicating with uh, uh, Canada Border Services about going up to the northwest angle. Talk to somebody up in the angle. They went out on, in front of their shoreline. There's five inches. So they're, they're staging fish houses pretty soon and it's all starting, you know, and, and again, I just say 
everybody's jacked up to go safety first. I should yeah. say too, by the way, Brett, uh, for, for people that are going to go to that St. Paul ice fishing show coming up next week, you know, Lake of the Woods oh, yeah. tours, we're going to be there. And uh, if you want a, a chance to win a, a, a free ice fishing trip to Rainy River Resort, we're going to be giving away a trip at the show. Uh, coming over, talk Lake of the Woods, talk ice fishing. Now we're going to have a booth. When you go down the escalator, we're right off the rotunda there and uh, on the main floor. And uh, uh, it's going to be fun. You know, we're kind of getting together again. Uh, we haven't been together in a sports show situation for uh, quite a while. Right. Absolutely. Well, uh, good luck at the show. So if people want to learn more about Lake of the Woods, they can come see you at the St. Paul Ice Show. Or what should they do, Joe? Hey, check out our website that uh, Brett's consulting us on. And that is uh, <laughs> Lake of the Woods, <laughs> MN.com. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit uh, turkey. We're going to talk holiday weekends. We're going to talk about early ice and getting ready to do some ice fishing right now. Uh, Dan Amundsen, of course, is with us. We'll bring Dan on right there. He's in Wisconsin uh, deer hunting. And then also Eric Osberg is up in Otter Tail County. Uh, Eric, um, Thanksgiving, do you do, do you travel for Thanksgiving? I, so and maybe you can appreciate this Thanksgiving is I put my stamp on Thanksgiving early in, in our marriage. Um, anybody out there who's married early in your marriage, you tend to go to like five Thanksgivings and six, seven Christmases. Right. And I, I just, I, I, at, it was early in our marriage. I said, you know what? Thanksgiving is our holiday. We're, we're, we're not going anywhere. If people want to come to us, great. The more the merrier. Um, but, uh, it was, it was, I don't know, like six or seven years ago, I said, Nope, we're not going to be there. You know, we're going to do our own thing. So the, the, the not so good news is when you make that claim, then now you're in charge, right? Like now you're, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta cook the bird. And it, does everybody come to your house then? It, some, some, my immediate family does my, my sister, my dad, um, and, and my nieces, and and this year we had a couple of extras um so but the extended family they they you know they stay where they're at but our immediate family my my immediate family i had the in-laws this year but so so the question i wanted to pose to you guys is do you brine your birds and i, I and whether you whether you cook thanksgiving meals or not i mean do you ever even just you know whether it's pheasants or or any of the game that you harvest do you brine birds or are you for brine or against brine? I, I like to brine. And uh, a lot of that is um, so for, for ducks, geese, pheasants, usually after I process them, uh, I put them right into right into water. Uh, really? sometimes it's salt water, sometimes it's just water. And then I throw them in the fridge and I let some of that blood get pulled out of that meat. And in fact, with a, with a Canada goose breast, I'll even, I don't pluck it. I just cut the breast out and then I trim the breast and I actually will cut when I clean a goose. Now it doesn't even look like, you know, for guys that have been breasting geese out, I'll have the legs cut out. I'll have the breast cut out. And then the breasts will all be basically cubed up into little chunks. And then all the, all the, the silver skin that's on there, the ventricles that are in there, all of that will be trimmed out. It won't look anything like it. And then when you dump those chunks into a, into a brine of some sort, it pulls that, that blood out of there uh, so much faster. And you've got a real nice lean piece of meat there. You got a lot of that wild flavor, that gamey flavor that some people like. Goose is kind of a strong flavor. If you don't like that, you can really reduce that, um, that, that strength of that goose flavor in there by doing that. And then I'll throw it in tacos or I'll slow cook it or I'll do something different. So long story short, yeah, Eric, I'm a fan of the brines. I, I'm a big brine guy too. You know, people, and you know, that's, I, I'm not saying I'm good at making Thanksgiving turkey. I, 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 I'm not claiming to be good at it, but I, it's part of the process for me. I, I like to brine. I, and somebody asked me why, 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 you know, why do you brine it? What does that do? And, and I, I think it's interesting the, just the, the, the reaction that salt has with protein. 
And so just by getting it in that salty water earlier than, you know, not, um, I, I think it, I think it creates a juicier meat. I think it creates a tender, a more tender meat, tendier. Is that a, is that a word? Um, and, and, <laughs> I'll sign off and, on it. And, and I, I, I think that, you know, and I've done this with steaks or, or red meat on a grill. The, the earlier you can get salt on meat, the earlier the, the, the cooking process starts, right? Like enzymes and proteins start interacting with that. There's a chemical reaction happening. So I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a scientist. So I just, I, you know, I like bride. I'm a bride guy. So, so you, you're doing the cooking on Thanksgiving then? I'm, well, I, I, I'm in charge of the bird. Um, I, I supervise the potatoes I, um, I, I'm going to mail it. I, I mailed it in with the, uh, with the stuffing. Um, I'm a stovetop guy, right? Like I, I've had a lot of homemade stuffing and no offense to anybody who proved me wrong, right? Like I've had a lot of homemade stuffing and I, I really like the taste of stovetop. So, you know, um, you know, so, it, and that's really all you need, you know, a good bird, um, some mashed potatoes, some gravy, and some stuffing, and I, I think you got a, I think you got a pretty solid holiday meal there. So after you brine it, are you putting it in the oven? Are you dropping it in a turkey fryer? What are you doing? Oven, um, and and I'm a, again, I, I'm not saying this is the right way to do it. It's just the way that I've found is, I, I cook it um, on a bed. Uh, is it called, what's it called a mirepoix? It's uh, you know, it's uh, there you go. It's, uh, I, I create a bed of celery, onions, and carrots, and then some, you know, some herbs, some, some rosemary, some thyme, some, some sage, and then uh, I cook it breast down for the, for the first half, or the first, maybe even two thirds, because if, if, you know, if you think about it, all those juices, just gravity is pulling those juices down, so if, if you're into the, you know, so the breast is on the top normally, so if we cook it breast down, all those juices are going down into the bird. And then, of course, it doesn't look as pretty when you cook it breast down. So the last half or the last third or the last hour, you got to flip it over. And then you get it nice and golden brown and you get that, that skin on it. So, you know, 325 in the oven for however long you need to based on the, the size of the bird. Gotcha. All right. So I'm going to bring Dan in here real quick. Um because we had a little discussion. We were talking a little bit off the air before this uh, about this situation, but my mom called me this year. She goes, hey, um, I got to ask you a question. Okay, it's a weird way to, uh, you, that always uh, right. makes you a little uneasy when you get that from mom or from anybody for that matter. And she says, how would you feel if we didn't have turkey for Thanksgiving this year? And I said, I, I mean, I like turkey, but like a, I don't look forward to turkey and mashed potatoes necessarily like in gravy. That's just, it's good and I'll eat it, but it's not like, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I can't wait for like, I look forward to Thanksgiving to get together with family and, you know, hang out. And it's been a tradition of ours for many years. It was a tradition of ours to be spending that, you know, Thanksgiving in the, in the woods of Northwest Wisconsin during the gun season over there. Uh, there's still some of that tradition, but we're not, having the meal there anymore. So the meal has changed, but we're still trying to get together and see family members that we haven't seen in a long time. So to me, that's what Thanksgiving's about. I was like, I, it doesn't matter to me. And she's like, well, what if we had lasagna? And I'm like, oh, now lasagna, I get excited about. I was just jacked. I'm like, heck yeah, we're having lasagna. And I told Dan, and then he talked to his, his mom and dad. And then he came back to me and goes, yeah, we're not having lasagna. <laughs> you can have, you can eat lasagna every day, 360, basically 363 days a year. You take Christmas and Thanksgiving out. Those are the two days you get to have a turkey dinner. So why you have, eliminate? You can, but you don't. We don't. So but why? So why? Did, they don't sell turkey at the store the rest of the year or? You, you know, nobody's going out to cook a turkey dinner on you know, June 14th. Because, because it's not that great of a meal. It's not How dare you. like, it's all, it's, it's all tradition. It's not Why? like nobody sits there and goes, Oh man, I'm going to go cook a Turkey for six hours today. I can't wait. This is going to be so good. Like you might need to go find a new producer. 
I, I think I, I, <laughs> I, I think I think like Dan's on to it. I think maybe Jeez. maybe one of these days. I tell you what, I'll cook you a turkey. I'll cook you a turkey. Uh, Brett, and we'll see if uh, we can't change your mind. I mean, it's good. I like wild turkey, and I like eating the, those giant turkey legs that you can get. Or like I've cooked some of my wild turkey legs, just grilled them. I think they're unbelievable. Uh, those I look forward to, or a wild turkey breast. I'll cube it up and uh, like a like a frying magic, some sort of Cajun uh, seasoning on there, Cajun uh, breading, and throw it in a deep fryer. I think it's unbelievable, but. Just oven baked turkey and mashed potatoes and gravy and stuffing. Like, I feel like, I don't know. It just doesn't. It doesn't do it for me. I'm with you, Dan. I'm. I'm totally. I'm. I'm with Dan on this one. I, now, I, yeah. put some. Let's do this next year. Let's put some turkey. Let's make turkey lasagna. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, you can, you're going to have to take guys. Eric's approach and start having your own Thanksgiving. That's fine. <laughs> that. I'm all right with it. Let me lasagna, right? Nobody will show up. All right. Nope. Well, uh, people are now looking at their radios like, why are these guys talking about <laughs> lasagna, turkey lasagna? We just wasted our entire time talking about ice fishing in Otter Tail Lakes country, Eric. So we'll have to do that uh, maybe next week or something. But if people want to learn more about Otter Tail County, whether uh, hunting, fishing, outdoor record, creation or just finding a job there where should they go they should find their inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com looking for winter adventure might as well pick a place with over 1,000 lakes ottertail county minnesota is in the middle of everywhere offers a simpler pace and has something for everyone. Find your inner otter at ottertillakescountry.com. Well, it's going to be that time of year, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, parts of our hunting seasons are winding down here this fall. It's always sad to talk about the end of the waterfall season. Of course, in northern Minnesota, you guys are done. Uh, in the central and southern zones now, you guys are also done after this weekend. Sunday, uh, the 28th being the closure date for those zones. I'm not happy about it. Of course, I'm never happy about it because I always feel like this is when duck hunting is starting to get good. And yeah, we got real cold around Thanksgiving and a lot of birds did migrate. But normally, when those big mallards come down that's about when things start to get really good uh where i'm at here and that i'm right on the border of the southern and central zone pretty much but it would have been nice to be able to go down into southern minnesota and hunt a few more days uh, but that's gone and not everybody's happy about it but that's the way it is uh, because some people didn't want to see it anymore so they complained about it and the dnr did actually change that so in any case we'll see if it stays that way in the future that means if you want to chase waterfall other than Canada geese, you're going to have to travel south. And uh, I was fortunate enough to do that. Uh, last year, I had a pretty epic trip with our next guest right here, Corey Loeffler. Corey, how's it going, man? It's going great. Thanks for having me. You bet. Uh you actually went back down recently to one of the places we went to last January. You were down in Oklahoma at Falco recently. How did that trip go? Yeah, it was awesome. Just like any other Falco experience. Uh, those guys do it right down there. They have an absolutely amazing lodge, great hunting, great food. Uh, the, the guys, the guides, the owners, they're all awesome people. So it's a blast. Uh, you, you can't really explain it any other way than that. He had a bunch of, there's a bunch of guys that were there that converged on Falco for that trip. You might, it must've been some sort of big shindig that we're going to find out more about later, I'm assuming, or some sort of uh, big old get together with some friends and brands. Yeah, it was just a big old get together with uh, all the Falco rowdy friends, I guess. So uh, there was a bunch of different brands and companies represented down there. I was fortunate enough to be one of the, the guests so we got to enjoy the falco experience with a bunch of industry partners uh, and industry friends that typically only see once or twice a year so it, it's good uh, some uh, long lost friends i guess you'd call it how was the hunting the hunting was pretty good it was um man it was it was really good a couple of days and then we just struggled with some weather and some other pressure stuff with the birds on a couple of days so uh, all in all it was a lot of fun 
and we got to see a few really, really big spins of of little geese do it, which is not super common for what we you know what we normally see in Minnesota. So those little geese can definitely put on a show if you let them, and um, watch and you know if spin and work the decoys is it's an eye opening experience. Yeah, I you know we get little bunches of little geese here in Minnesota, uh, not like it is down south down there. I had no idea it was like that further south. I'm used to these big Canadas and the EPPs that we get through here. Um, and I've always heard, and I, t- I know we've talked about this on the show, I've always heard that those little little Canada geese are like working snows, but they really are like, it, it feels like you're hunting snow geese. They're just a different color bird. Yeah, absolutely. And they feed a lot of times with snow geese. So the one hunt uh, let's see typically we hunted out of an a-frame style blind on the edge of a field and then one of the hunts we actually put um, dark uh, like canada goose socks dark socks and light socks out and we hid underneath those sock style decoys um, so a sock being like a windsock style and um, we just laid on back rests in uh half whites those sick of whites that we were running around with last year put white bibs on and a marsh colored jacket and then kind of covered up with um light and dark colored decoys laid under the decoys it was very very successful hunt very um kind of a unique way of hiding but very effective i bet you didn't uh have any good food while you're down there either <laughs> uh uh, yeah, I, well, I started out, I had shot a deer in South Dakota on, oh, it was like Saturday, last Saturday, and I shot that deer, I got it hung up, I saved the heart, and I saved the call fat, I brought that, well, I saved the whole deer, but I brought those two things with me, and I hit the road to Falco about nine hours later, and uh, we threw that, uh, just like Corey Loeffler fashion, I guess we <laughs> turned the flat top off on and as soon as i got there so we had some deer heart wrapped in call fat and that was my entire supper that first night everyone had got done eating but i showed up about 10 p.m so uh, i was a late comer around there and it was it was kind of wild now call fat something kind of new to me i've been hearing more and more about it in the last uh, couple of years explain to people what call fat is it's kind of that spider web looking fat that would line the um the intestines or the abdomen abdominal fat so to say and i'm sure you've seen it probably Mm -hmm. in a gut pile here or there but um yeah like i said it looks like a giant spider web and if done properly and you don't um, nick the guts with your knife while you're while you're gutting it or you don't shoot it in there if it's proper shot up in the up front in the boiler room you can utilize that call fat and wrap burgers i've had elk burger or no excuse me uh moose burgers wrapped in moose call fat before um i've done some stuff with some sausage wrapped in call fat and then now heart wrapped in the call fat so there you go it's right on the screen right there that's exactly what it looks like how did it turn out? Oh, it was perfect. I loved it. I ate nearly the entire thing because I didn't tell anyone that it was done, and uh, I didn't want to share it. So <laughs> <laughs> I was starving. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, that's Brian back there, right, that, that cooks at uh, Falco? Yeah. Yeah, yep, how Brian, does, how the does, chef. Yeah. How does he feel about you coming back there and just turning his flat top on? He just smiles and says, have at it, buddy. Just clean up when you're done. So, <laughs> That's awesome. Man, it uh, is, this we, is, all those guys are such great guys down there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we love talking recipes and talking cooking and techniques and stuff. And uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. That, uh, that Falco experience, every part of it, every step along the way is um, – just kind of mind-blowing really it's a great place it's fun tell us how you like to make venison heart oh that was wrapped in call fat seasoned with a little bit of salt and garlic salt and pepper and fried in a little butter on the flat top so you just wrapped the whole heart or did you oh no sorry i diced 
Yeah, I diced the heart up into like one inch cubes, basically trimmed some of the, um, the, uh, what would be the ventricles Mm -hmm. off and, uh, trimmed some of that stuff off and some of the hard, harder tissue that's in the heart and just ate the, just ate the good stuff. It's one of my favorite cuts. Oh, it's delicious. And I know that's one Dan's with us here, of course. And Dan, whoop, we just lost Dan just shot, uh, shot a deer and he's got, you're ready to cook up that heart, aren't you, Dan? Okay, good talk. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm in the boonies. Yeah, he's he's off deer hunting in Wisconsin right now. Dan, are you, can you, if you can hear me, are you seeing any ducks mm-hmm. and geese over there in northwest Wisconsin oh, right now? The la- the lake's loaded. It is. Yep, it's loaded with gold knives, Canada's mallards, you name it. We've did got you it. end up Did you end up buying a, a license to shoot some waterfowl? No. No, I've given the Wisconsin DNR enough of my money to be over here as it is, and uh, uh, time to chase deer for the amount of money we paid to do that. So yeah, for sure, that's what we're after. All right, Corey, what's what's new in the DRC shop right now? We got going on up well, there. Well, big big news right now. Rue started spotting, came into heat while I was in Falco. That would be last week. She's on about day six or seven of spotting so big things should be coming i am going to take a drive uh down to arkansas that's where the stud dog is that i have lined up and uh chaos is his name very very nice looking dog physically and pedigree wise Uh, so that'll be uh chaos chaos that'll be a little bit of a chaotic litter this this uh winter but uh we're really looking forward to it a lot of people want to get their hands on those roo pups so super excited for that and um can't wait i love that picture of roo right there (laughs) that was her first goose retrieve ever and that bird came equipped with a aluminum band on one leg and a plastic tarsal band on the other leg. So of course it did. Pre- pretty special <laughs> goose. Pretty special picture. Pretty special little uh, dog. Do it. It fills me with the warmth and joy of the holiday season. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Hey, she did set the. She did set this year's Falco blind retrieve record at 400 yards. Uh, hen mallard that JD had winged, and uh, yeah, that was a that was a big one. I uh, pretty much lost, almost lost sight of her. She, I think, lost sight of me because I was wearing all camo and had a uh, tree line for a backdrop. So I had to pick up a dive bomb silhouette goose decoy that we were using i picked that up and used that to cast her and give her hand signals when she was way back there and uh by golly she picked it up in not very many whistles honestly and uh it was pretty cool we had a a whole bunch of clients out that day and they were blown away at it with that so conservation's finest tool right there a well-trained retriever 100 percent uh, especially, uh, I, you know, it's, you're talking about waterfall, but especially, you know, if you're pheasant hunting or upland hunting or something like that, you won't find most of your birds without a dog out there that you shoot. So especially if they got any life left in them. Yeah. Got to have a good one. All right, Corey. Well, uh, thanks for the update. Uh, sound like a fun trip down there. Good luck with, uh, with Rue this week and, uh, and the rest Thank of the you. fall. And thanks for the time on the show, man. Yeah, absolutely. That was a blast. Thanks a lot. Check them out, DRC Calls. Uh, find them online on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and all the usual social media channels. Corey, thank you very much. Thank you. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to sportingjournalradio.com.